who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Thank you, Rodney. Wow, that was uh, extremely powerful. And uh, I just got to say this. I'm amazed at how many times when our elders are doing devotionals and stuff, and we really don't, as the pastor of the fellowship and the elders, we don't cooperate the content of what they're sharing and what I'm teaching, but I'm amazed how often Holy Spirit does that. And the passages that he shared from Romans 8 are extremely powerful, and uh, it's even part of what I'm going to be sharing today. Even though we're in Matthew, we're going to finish Matthew 16 today. Again, we're going to bring come back to a few of those passages towards the end of the time in the Word today, and it's just extremely powerful. So thank you, Rodney, for your diligence and preparation, and it's obvious you've been spending time with the Lord, and I know He's at work in your heart and your life, and it's inspiring to us to have those passages. So again, welcome to all those who are tuning in with us this morning. Uh, if you're tuning in late, we're so glad you guys are with us. And, and we know that there are many people around our community. Uh, we've even heard that there are people back east in Wisconsin, Oklahoma, California, uh, North Dakota, different places where people are tuning in to connect with us. So wherever you may be, welcome. We're so glad you're here this morning. And by the way, I think uh, when we get through this unique season that we're in, with the whole COVID-19 situation, right? And uh, it's changed the dynamic of what we're doing here. And I, I don't like that statement, the new normal, in that it's trying to say that things will never get back to normal. Who knows what things are going to look like moving forward? But we do know that with what we've had to do and the scope of the online ministry is reaching so many more people than was happening before. Because we've been averaging the last two Sundays specifically, once we started doing Facebook Live, uh, Palm Sunday was about one, about 1,300 people, or 1,300 views, not people, that's just views, because most of those are homes with multiple people for Palm Sunday, and that includes YouTube Live and Facebook Live, and then last Sunday, which was Resurrection Sunday, that's in the neighborhood now of uh, 1,500 views, and in a lot of those situations, there are people at homes. So again, we're so thankful you guys are tuning in. We pray that if you know the Lord, that you're being edified, that God's living word is speaking to your heart and your life. And we do pray for those who've been tuning in who don't know Jesus, that the Lord is opening your eyes and your heart spiritually to the understanding that you need him, that he is the way, the truth, and life. There's no other answer to uh, eternal life, right? It's not works. It's not effort. It's not any just smorgasbord of religions. It, it truly is all about Jesus. So again, we're thankful you're here with us today. And folks, continue to pray. Um, hopefully sooner than later, we'll be able to gather together again as a church family and have even some newer people come and join us. And uh, I talked to one of the county commissioners last, last week, and they're starting to move forward with some adjustments. There will be some announcements, I believe, community-wide even tomorrow about some of the things they're doing in terms of phasing things back to normalcy. So be looking for that. And prayerfully, sooner than later, we'll all be back in here again, right? And probably back to two services to accommodate everybody. And uh, eventually, down into that new building, work does continue to go on there. This hasn't phased that at all, so praise God for that, okay? So again, the main thing is what God is doing in the hearts and lives of the people, right? Spiritually, people are growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And to that end, before we get in the Word, just a reminder that several of our Calvary Connection community groups continue Monday nights, and they're streaming, right? They're not meeting here, but streaming live at 6.30 tomorrow night is our young adult group. You have to go to our Ashley Valley Calvary Chapel main page, and you can find the young adult page there uh, in, on Facebook as well. And you can join that if you're 18 to 30, if you want to be part of that study. One of our elders, Rob Evans, leads that. Really, really powerful study. Tuesday nights, we do our men's study. And I've been given the privilege of teaching that. We're in 1 Timothy. We concluded chapter 4 last week. So we're going to jump into 1 Timothy chapter 5 this week, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. But for the guys, we've been doing it on YouTube Live and not Facebook Live. Seems like more guys uh, connect with YouTube than do Facebook. And then Wednesday nights, we're still in the book of Revelation. And that's at 7 o'clock. We're in chapter 21. And we have worship before that and prayer from 6.30 to 7. So we appreciate you guys turning in, tuning in for that. And we're really closing in on concluding that particular study. By the way, so that you do know this, we were uh, initially scheduled two months ago before this thing all changed, right, to start a study on heaven, to wrap Revelation up and start a study on heaven on the 15th, which is this last Wednesday. But we're deferring that. We're delaying and postponing that study because it's one of those studies that's so dynamic that we need people to be able to be together in the same room. 
So when the timing is right and we can do that, we'll get back into that. We'll look at that study on heaven, which is, of course, our destination as believers when we leave this world and we enter into God's presence. So be looking for that. And again, when the time is right, we'll be able to do that. If we conclude the book of Revelation, and we likely are to do that before we get into the heaven study, then we'll do another shorter study before we do that, okay? And then on Thursday nights, one more Calvary Connection small community group. My wife teaches on Thursday nights on Facebook Live at 630 and right now they're in Colossians, and I know that's been a huge blessing to a lot of the women who are engaged. So praise the Lord, we're having a lot of people connect with us through those, and we just can pray that you're being fed and ministered to through all of these opportunities. So God continues to move, right? And again, I know we're excited to get back together again, and until we can do that, we'll just, you know, we'll just push forward, right? We'll continue to do what we're doing. Having said that, let's jump into the Word. Let's move our attention now to Matthew chapter 16. And folks, this is where we were before we entered into the resurrection season, right? So the last two Sundays, this last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday. The Sunday before that was Palm Sunday. So, of course, we made an emphasis and a focus on those uh, particular settings back uh, almost 2,000 years ago that were so critical, obviously, Jesus riding into Jerusalem. We did a Passover Seder presentation on the Wednesday of that week, as it's all about Jesus, how we fulfilled that, and everything crescendoed last week. It was an amazing celebration of worship, the reality that Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. And what an exciting and amazing reality, because it truly is. So now that we've moved through that season, we're back into our verse-by-verse study in Matthew 16, and we're going to conclude that chapter today. So I want you to join me by focusing on verses 21 through 28. We'll read these passages first, and then we'll pray, and then we'll begin to really open them up. And you know what? What a rich chapter this has been, because we've been here and spent a lot of time in this chapter for good reason. And I'll uh, review that for a moment once we go through these. So let's pick it up in verse 21 of Matthew 16. I'm teaching and reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says this, From that time Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took Him aside and began to rebuke Him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But He turned and He said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we continue this powerful and amazing study on this journey through the Gospel of Matthew, Lord, it's been remarkable all these months, Lord, that we've been here, and we're excited to continue this journey. And Father, as we've read those passages just now and as we begin to really open them up and mind them for the depth and the riches, Lord, that they possess, God, we know that even reading through that, they're challenging. And Father, these are serious, serious patches that remind us as believers, God, that our calling is to walk with you, to make you first in our lives, to make sure that you're seated on the throne of our hearts, God, that we're willing, God, to pay a price if it's required to be faithful to you, Lord. As long as we follow you, God, the eternal reality is what matters most. And as Rodney shared this morning from Romans 8, God, that big picture perspective is what we need as believers to walk in, to not focus so much on today and today's cares and issues, Lord, but to keep our eyes fixed on you, knowing, Lord, that soon and very soon we're going to be in your very presence, God. So we pray that as we go through these passages again, that that we're edified, Lord, that we're encouraged, that we find comfort if we need it. Lord, that perhaps there will be some who are challenged, God, by these passages. I know I am when I read these, Lord, and I go through these because it does remind us of the seriousness, Lord, of our walk with you. 
So Holy Spirit, help us to navigate these passages today. May we take away from this word, God, what it is you intend us to have. And thank you again, Lord, that your word is living and powerful, and it has the capacity and ability to transform our hearts and our lives today. So meet us right where we're at, in our living rooms or wherever we may find ourselves, Lord. Pour out your spirit and meet us here in Jesus' mighty and awesome name. Amen. Amen. So before we jump back into the passages we just read, just a quick reminder. In chapter 16 of Matthew, incredibly, incredibly powerful chapter. In fact, this is, I believe, the sixth study from this chapter alone. Because earlier on, we saw that reality. And I want to remind you quickly again that in chapter 16 earlier on, beginning in verse 13, that Jesus had taken the disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, remember? And that's where he asked them, who do people say that I am? And so they said, well, the word on the street is, you know, that you're John the Baptist, basically come back from the dead, or Elijah, or Jeremiah. You're one of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus said, okay, so that's what people out there are wondering or thinking who I may be. But then he personalized it, right? And he asked them, as he will ask all of us, because everybody needs to answer this question and answer it rightly. Who do you say that I am, right? And that's where we saw that Peter said, because the Father showed him that you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, right on, Peter, you got it. And flesh and blood, no human being has revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Remember that reality? And we spent three weeks just camping on those passages, going all the way back in the Old Testament and clearly defining and answering that question, who is Jesus? Because if you don't have the definition right, and you miss him for who he is, you can spend all eternity separated from him if you don't know him for who he is. So I encourage you, if you weren't part of that, you can go back on Facebook, or you actually can go back to our YouTube page and catch some of those studies as well and get caught up, because it's very, very powerful, right? Again, life is all about relationship, that we would know the Lord first and foremost, have that relationship, and then love those that we share life with, our family, our friends, people we work with, uh, loving the people in our neighborhoods and our community, all of those things. But it all comes out of relationship with God. So then we had our break. Again, Palm Sunday last week, of course, Resurrection Sunday. And I find that as we pick it up here now again in verse 21, that this is what Jesus told the disciples just prior to what we experienced and celebrated the last two weeks, right? We pick it up in verse 21 of Matthew 16. That after Jesus had taken them up to Caesarea Philippi, after he had told Peter that he was correct and his understanding of who Jesus is, remember Jesus told Peter that he was Petros, a little stone. But upon this rock, Petra, meaning Jesus speaking of himself, that he would build his church and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. And then moving forward from that, talking about giving authority, right? And no, Peter is not the first pope. He played a unique role in the early church. But we don't find anything in God's Word that elevates him even above the rest of the apostles. The Lord had a unique work for him as he preached the gospel in Acts chapter 2. And then later on in Acts, it was all of the Holy Spirit how God used him. But now we've come to this place, after having celebrated the reality of the resurrection, that this is the first time that Jesus tells them, and he would three more times before his crucifixion tell them this. Again, verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show the disciples, his disciples, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So when Jesus shares that now, that reality with them, look at Peter's response. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He begins to rebuke Jesus, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. Folks, there's some really powerful stuff to focus on here. As we look at this and what Jesus said, and what we gave great depth through the last couple of weeks looking at about Jesus going to Jerusalem and suffering in the hands of the Jewish religious leaders, being killed and then being raised from the third day, Peter's problem here really is one of perception and really understanding. His perspective was skewed. How often do we come to the Lord or come to God's Word with a perception or a perspective that's not consistent with God's Word? And we try to force that on God. We try to force our perception and our perspective and try to get God to conform to what we think and how we think things should be in our personal circumstances or situations. We're all guilty of that, right? 
And that's exactly what Peter did here. Now, here's the reality. They had been walking with Jesus, and they loved him so much. And they were just being drawn more and more to him. The Lord was at work with him. And we have a man who just prior to this had declared rightly so who Jesus was. And Jesus said, look, Peter, you're going to have an amazing role in the church. And by the way, that was the first time he even used the phrase church, right? Ecclesia, because that would come into play after his resurrection. But now we have this man who says, and here's the reality. I think we can all identify. If you were walking with Jesus and you loved him so, and all of a sudden you hear him say, I'm going to go and we're going to go to Jerusalem, but this is going to be what happens. How they're going to treat me and what they're going to do to me, and they're going to kill me, but I will be raised on the third day. I think Peter was so fixated on that term that they will kill me, that I will be killed, that he just lost track of everything. And, you know, in his heart, was he, was he off track in this? I don't think we would probably all say no because I, maybe we'd respond the same way to pull Jesus aside and say, Lord, how could this happen, right? Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. That was something he did out of love, but it was misplaced. It was misplaced. And so as we read verse 23, this is remarkable. Jesus rebukes Peter. (laughs) He corrects him when we find this. Verse 23, but he, that would be Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Petros, little stone, get behind me, Satan. Whoa, can you imagine like Peter going, whoa, (laughs) I didn't expect to hear that, (laughs) right? We just had this dialogue, and you said I was Petros, and, and you were going to use me in amazing ways, and now you're, you're looking at me saying, get behind me, Satan. I think we would all probably be taken aback. We would probably be shocked and stunned. And the reality is, it was more about Satan's agenda to try to keep Jesus from fulfilling his mission of going to the cross. All of that really is what is in view here. And Peter was misguided in telling Jesus, no, you shouldn't die. You shouldn't die. But Jesus responded, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Again, his perspective, his perception was not consistent with God's plans and purposes. And so Jesus needs to bring him into a place of understanding for that. Because again, remember, Satan wanted to derail Jesus' plan, right? Remember in Matthew chapter 4, for example, after Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River and the Messianic ministry begins, the Holy Spirit has come upon him. He goes into the desert immediately, and there's testing for 40 days, right? And what happens when Jesus is in a state of vulnerability? He's literally hungry physically because he's a human being. In that state of vulnerability, that's when the enemy comes and tempts Jesus Christ, right? And what does Jesus do? He responds by telling him to depart from him. He uses the Word of God. He quotes Old Covenant Scriptures every time. And ultimately, he says, get behind me, Satan. Get out of here. Go away. And he rebukes him. And really, that's what Jesus is saying here. Again, that's the spirit of what Peter said to try to derail Jesus from fulfilling his ultimate goal of what he was trying to do. Let's go back to chapter 10 of Matthew. There's another place here that we find some very, very powerful passages. And after Jesus had called the apostles, right, there was a time where he told them he was going to send them out, and it's really a, a broad perspective of the circumstances and the things they might face. But we find this in chapter 10. Let's pick it up in verse 34. Verse 34 of Matthew 10, and we'll look from verse 34 through 39. Jesus says this, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth, even though he's the Prince of Peace and Yahweh Shalom, right? The reality is when Jesus came as the Messiah, it would cause division. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What does a sword do? A sword cuts, it divides. Jesus' agenda was black and white, and there are a lot of people who didn't want to receive it, didn't want to receive it, and still don't want to receive it. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Keep that in mind, we just said that. In verse 39, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake 
will find it. He's already stated that. He's very black and whitely stating here back in Matthew 10 that the reality of his call to discipleship and really following him as Messiah is a wholehearted commitment that many may not understand. You know what? There are many families, there are many people that I know, maybe people that you know, maybe this has been your experience. After you've come to know Jesus, the work he's doing and has done in your life is so incredibly dynamic that your family and friends think you're a Jesus freak. And all of a sudden they start, they get offended because you want to talk about the things of God. And you know what? They're still in that state where they get uncomfortable about that, especially as you're growing in your grace and knowledge of Jesus, that that light of Christ starts to shine on their dark hearts. And they don't like it. That's what Jesus is saying back here in chapter 10, that if we choose to follow God, those who don't want anything to do it, do with him, it's going to cause a division. So Jesus says we have to count the cost. And it's sad, folks. When sometimes, in families even, people who choose to follow Jesus, they have family members who say, man, as long as you're going to live like that and you're going to do this, you know, I really don't want to be around you. And that's painful and that hurts. But sometimes that's what happens. And you have to make a choice. Is it my family? Is it my friends? Is it my children? Or is it Jesus? If they choose to reject me, we love them wholeheartedly, right? We'll always love them and pray for them, but they are really the ones who make the choice to reject you and to reject Jesus. And when it says that you should love Jesus more than your mother and your father or your children, right? I mean, some translations will say hate, and that's not what he's saying. He's saying you should hate them. No, he's saying, look, in issues, when it relates to priority, am I the priority? Am I your first love? And folks, as we go back to Matthew 16, in essence, that's what Jesus is saying here, right? What is your priority? What is your priority? Are you willing to pay a cost? Are you willing to be a disciple? Because Jesus had already told them in verse 21 that he was going to pay a price. It would cost him his life. It would cost him in the uniqueness of the triunity of the Godhead to be separated from the Father for a moment in time. And when he stood in Gethsemane and said, Father, if there's any other way for this cup of wrath to not be my experience, if there's any other way, but he said, yet nonetheless, not my will, Father, but your will, right, be done. There are dynamics in that, guys, that we can't even begin to comprehend. Jesus paid a price. There was a cost. Our salvation is a gift that He gives us that we purchase through His sacrifice on our behalf. Amen? But here's the reality. When we choose to follow Him, there is a price to pay, Jesus is saying. There is a cost to it. And are, we, are we willing to count that cost? And I know as even as I share that and we begin to move forward in these other passages, it's a little get, you get a little uncomfortable and you're like, whoa. Well, here's the reality, folks. This Americanized name it and claim it prosperity crap, and I'll call it what it is out there, tries to tell you that when you come to Jesus, it's all butterflies and roses and all this stuff. And God's Word says, hey, no, if you're going to really follow me and you're serious, there will be at some point some opposition. And when that opposition comes, what will you do? Because it's easy to say we love Jesus and that we want to follow him until there's spiritual pushback, there's spiritual warfare, or the people that we know and love begin to say, you know what, I really don't want to be around you. If you're going to make Jesus the center of your life, then you know what, that really annoys me. And so you're going to have to make a choice. Folks, that's what he's talking about here, priorities. But you know what? As Rodney shared from Romans 8, big picture perspective, any challenges we may experience are all worth it because they're so short, right, compared to eternity. We should keep our eyes fixed on the prize and the reality of that. But folks, here's the truth too. We love those around us. If they reject us, we don't reject them. We love them, and we're available to them. We want to share life with people, even though they might reject us. We want to love them. We want Jesus to shine through us so they would come to him. But here's the reality. If we do make Jesus first and foremost, if we do suffer rejection and pushback, whatever the cost may be, folks, it's worth it because when we're really dialed into the Lord like we should be, There's a peace that only Jesus can give that nobody else can give or anything can give. There's a love 
that Jesus only can bring, that no other person or anything else can bring. There's a state of shalom, well-being, that Jesus alone, who is Yahweh Shalom, can only bring, that nothing else can bring to us. So it's when we make a great exchange, and yes, we have to make a choice sometimes, and for all of us, it's different. And again, we are, it's sobering. But again, Jesus is just saying as we move forward here, are you willing to count the cost? When it comes to it, what are your priorities? Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, right, to really follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Wow. Are you one who desires to follow him? If Jesus were standing here today and said, if you desire to follow me and come after me, you must deny yourself. What does that mean? That means that you're willing to make Jesus your priority, that his kingdom and his agenda is your priority. That's what matters most. Is Jesus saying that you can't have fun? No, I mean, the greatest joy is really walking with him, right? Does he saying that you can never have, you know, any time out with your family doing this and that? No, but it is about priorities. It's about balance and having our life in order. But he is saying this, look, if it comes down to it and you have to make that choice, are you willing to die to yourself? When he says, take up, die, deny yourself, right? That means don't be self-centered, self-focused and take up your cross. Folks, back in that day when the Romans would execute people on a cross, the people were forced to carry their cross and it signaled to everybody who watched that and when they ultimately hung on the cross, it would signal the price they paid for rebellion against the Roman Empire. This is the price that you would pay and everybody understood that when you looked at a cross, it meant death. Things die on a cross. The cross is a cruel altar that Jesus gave his life on as the Lamb of God. Amen? So when Jesus says, take up his cross, take up your cross and follow me, he's saying, are you willing then, if it comes to it, to suffer for me? Look at this. He's talking contextually initially to the disciples. Judas would betray him, would not be a part of this. He would kill himself. The rest would die for the cause of Christ. They would try to kill John, and it didn't take. They sent him to Patmos, right? They tried to boil him in oil, as history tells us. All of these guys paid a price to follow Jesus. They lived in a time where they not only watched people being hung on crosses before Jesus did, they watched him hang from the cross, and they knew it meant dying. It meant suffering. Are we willing to suffer if it ever comes down to it for the cause of Christ. That's where we find that we're really all in. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, as long as life is comfortable and things are going well, it's easy to say that, but when things start to change, and we live in a world, again, remember, we talk about this a lot, that most believers live in third world countries where they are persecuted. The church is growing immensely in China and in Iran. God is on the move. And those two nations right there are the ones that persecute believers probably worse than anybody else in North Korea. It's, it's horrible what they do. And you know what? The Chinese government is stepping up their persecution against Christians. And yet the church continues to grow. It's been said in history that the blood of the saints is the seed for the church, the blood of the martyrs, right? It's, it's interesting because as we look at church history, every time the church is persecuted, it grows exponentially. You would think that Satan would be smart enough to think, I'm just going to keep my hands off and not mess with them because when I do mess with them, then it grows. But you know what? I think he's got such a bloodlust. He can't help but steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10, 10, right? That's his heart. He can't help himself. But remember the latter half of John 10.10. 10. But Jesus came to give life, and life more abundantly, and he means spiritually in that relationship with him. And when we choose to follow him, to deny ourselves and take him our cross and follow him, that's when we do walk in that fullness of life, that abundance of life, that Jesus is our priority. Amen? Verse 25 says this, For whoever desires to save or preserve his life will lose it. He's saying whoever makes life the side of eternity, your priority, the things of this life, separate from the kingdom of God, if that is your focus, then guess what? 
Whoever loses his life then for my sake will find it. But who doesn't? Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Again, what are our priorities? Do we live for self or do we live for Jesus and his kingdom? That's really what's in view there. How powerful is that, folks? You think about Romans 12, 1, when Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable response, right, an act of worship. We find this in Galatians. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2. A lot of you are familiar with these passages, and you should be. And some of us have what we call life verses, right? And this has been, Galatians 2.20 has been my life verse, if you will, for a long, long time. Because a long, long time ago, I discovered that I can't do anything. If I'm in charge, if I'm living, there's no eternal value in anything that I do. I have to die to myself. And folks, for all of us, that's a struggle. It can be daily, it can be moment by moment, but the more we experience that reality and Jesus is seated on the throne of our hearts, the better. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified. What happens on a cross? Crucifixion, death. Paul said, I have been crucified. I have died with Christ and it is no longer I who live. He said, I am not calling the shots. I'm not in control, but Christ, Messiah, lives in me. Isn't that the amazing reality when he, we're born again, the Holy Spirit indwells us, that Jesus is living in us in this powerful way. And the life which I now live in the body, in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that amazing? I don't know about you, those are the kind of passages, one of the reasons that's my life verse, I can, I can barely quote that or read that and I'm brought to tears because it's so powerful and so moving what Jesus did, right? I live by faith in the Son of God who what? Who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. My reasonable response, according to Romans 12, 1, is to reciprocate, to love Jesus and to give my all in all for him. And that's what he's talking about in Matthew 16. That's what it means to take up your cross and to follow him, to deny yourself. And look at verse 21 of Galatians 2. I do not set aside the grace of God. We're saved by grace, right? And we need God's grace to empower us. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Again, he said, look, grace is really important here. To empower me to truly live for God as he would have me to. And since we're in the neighborhood, go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Just a couple books over here. An incredibly powerful letter, right? So in Philippians, as we read chapter 3 is where we're going to pick it up. You see that Paul, after living this very religious life, as he explains that, even defines that and says, nobody had lived the life of a Pharisee better than he had. We find this in verse 7, Philippians 3. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Thinking about our life, thinking about what we're seeing in Matthew 16, can we say that? As we weigh our lives, as we look at our priorities, are those things gain or is it Jesus that's gain? Paul said all those things that really used to matter, he now counts as loss. What? For Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul suffered, right? Look at the record of what he experienced because of his faithfulness to God. He counted the cost, and he was willing to suffer. You and I, as believers in America, the chance that you and I would even come remotely close to paying any kind of price like these guys did, or believers in a third world country, probably not going to happen. But here's our challenge, our comfort our creature comforts and all the things that make us comfortable distract us from the kingdom and the things of God. Do we count that all loss? Because we may not suffer for the loss of Christ, right? We count these things all loss. But he says, and then I count them as rubbish. Remember, that's dung. That's what that word literally means. That I may gain Christ and be found in Him. He's already had salvation, so He wants to go deeper is what He's saying. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Look at this, verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. 
Wow, I think we are all on board with that, right? Wow, that I would know him, that I would go deeper with him, and to, to walk in that power that's, that raised Jesus from the dead. Folks, that's incredible. That's the kind of power that when Jesus spoke and created the entire universe, that's the kind of power that raised him from the dead. We go, yeah, I want to I experience that, the power of his resurrection. That's not the whole verse. Then Paul said, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Woo. We would say, sign me up for the first part of that. Oh, but I don't know about the whole suffering part. Folks, here's the reality is we're thinking about Matthew 16. We'll hear people say stuff like, you know, well, I've got, I've got, you know, bad health. I've got this and that. That's my cross to bear. That's not your cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about anything that is about Jesus Christ himself and his kingdom. And should we suffer pushback or suffer loss because of Jesus and his word and his kingdom? That's the cross to bear. Kingdom related things. Let's pick it up in verse 12, Philippians 3. Not that I have already attained. Remember, he's already saved, so we're not talking about salvation. Not that I already attained or am already perfected or completed, he's saying, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus had also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing, right? Not a multiplicity of things, not a plethora, but one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What would Paul say right here? What could we say right here? It's all about Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. He said, you know what? I have not maximized the depth of relationship I can experience with Jesus. The one thing that he pressed on to do was to go deeper with the Lord, knowing that someday, guess what? There's going to be an upward call. We're going home, folks. We're going home, and there will be accountability before Jesus of what we've done with our lives. So we live for self. Have we saved ourselves? what Jesus said in Matthew 16, or have we died to self and have life in Him, making His kingdom the priority? And remember the eternal perspective in Philippians 3 and verse 20. Paul said, for our citizenship, present tense, is in heaven. If we're a believer, guess what? Our citizenship is there. For as if we're seated in the heavenly places right now, Ephesians 2. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know, are you eagerly waiting? Maranatha, right? Even so, Jesus, come. Come quickly, Lord. Look at verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, that resurrected state, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Again, like Rodney taught from shared in the devotional in Romans 8, big picture perspective, the current sufferings now are not even anything worthy of consideration when you compare it to the big picture perspective and eternity. Folks, when Jesus starts, he finishes. What his word has promised will happen. So we go back to Matthew 16. We look at verse 25 and now 26 as well. Verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life, right, focus on this life, will lose it. Because, again, there's no eternal value for the things that are self-centered and self-focused if it's not about glorifying the Lord. But whoever loses his life, prioritizes otherwise, this kingdom of God and Jesus, right, for my sake, right, will find it. Verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Think about that. For what profit is it if a man gains the whole world? So hypothetically, it's hyperbole. Even if you could have everything this world has to offer riches-wise. You had all the gold. You had all the money. You made Bill Gates and, and the, the dude with Amazon look like paupers because you had all the wealth of the world. What does God's Word say? If you could do that. He gains the whole world. What profit is it if you lose your own life, your own soul, suke, life, your soul, right? There's a couple of things about this. Salvifically, 
right? If a person says, I don't want to choose Jesus as Savior, I don't want to follow Him because I love this world. I love the things of the world. I love what this world offers. That's the choice they've made. And I'm striving to gain what this world has to offer. Well, guess what? You could gain everything this world has to offer. And what will ultimately profit you in the scheme of things long term? Nothing! Because someday you're going to die. And you'll spend eternity separated from Jesus if you've chosen this world over Him. Folks, there's no U-Haul behind a hearse, ever. Job said, naked I came into this world and naked I will leave it. But he also said, I know that my Redeemer lives. Right? And he believed in resurrection. And Jesus is raised from the dead. That's the power of what He's saying. But also, think about this as a Christian. If we do know Jesus, and this is not salvation, but we know Him, what worth is it, really? to strive for the things of this world at the expense of your relationship with Jesus. If a priority is still earthly-centered and the things of this world, and Jesus plays second fiddle to that, folks, what a poor exchange. It's not worth it, and it won't be with it worth it because someday again we're going to draw our last breath as Christians we're going to stand before Jesus and give an account will we have made the right choices right will we have made the right choices or will again what or what will a man give in exchange for his soul folks there's nothing you can give in exchange Jesus is the one who paid the price to redeem us incredibly powerful isn't it thinking about that by the way this is the power of choice And everyone has a choice to accept or reject Jesus. God is ultimately fair. The grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men, Titus 2.11. God is ultimately fair. And to accept Jesus, you have a choice to make. He doesn't force you. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But you make a choice to accept Jesus. And then once we know Him, we make a choice daily whether we're going to take up our cross and follow Him, whether we're going to make Him our priority in the kingdom of God, our priority. Choice is powerful. Remember, I think about Joshua in 24, when it said, choose this day who you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Back in the Old Covenant Scriptures, back in the Torah, and it says in various passages, God says, black and white, today I set before you blessing and cursing. Choose! Some people might say, well, the blessing would be the comfortable life. You know what? Not necessarily. His point is this. Cursing means you've chosen the things that are not of God. Blessing is choosing God's way. Amen? That's what God is saying here. The power of choice, and we all have to make that choice. And in verse 27 says this. This is powerful as we begin to wind down. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. Not salvation again. We're saved by grace through faith. But after we're saved, God gives us the opportunity and there will be what's called a repayment. Mistos, wages for the works that we've done that have impact in His kingdom. And there are two ways to look at this. For those who rejected Jesus salvifically, they don't know Him, someday they will stand before the great white throne judgment. We just saw that in Revelation this last week in Revelation 20. The great white throne judgment is where God judges the works of all those throughout history who have rejected Him. And you know what? They, they will not be saved because you can't gain salvation through your works. But you know what? Judgment will have a part to play in the condemnation because those whose sin is greater and their separation from God for eternity, theirs will be the greater condemnation. The worse your sin is, the things that you did, it's worse. Just like in God's kingdom, if we've been faithful to follow the Lord, there is reward. There is position in God's kingdom, and that shouldn't be our ultimate goal. Our goal should be to love Him, and our motive is to follow Him and to be faithful to Him and let God take care of that. But when we're faithful, we will stand before the Lord, and He will give rewards. And by the way, contextually, He's talking about the second coming here. Jesus is fast forwarding saying, look, there is going to come a time where there's reckoning, there's accountability and that's for Christians before the Bema seat and there's accountability for those who reject Him. Folks, how important is that to understand? We see that in Matthew 24, we see it in Daniel, we see it in Zechariah, it's all throughout God's Word. And then finally, verse 28 says this, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of man or the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Let me read. I really blew that. Let me read that one more time. 
Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man, that's Him, Jesus, coming in His kingdom. Now, there are some people who misunderstand this. And here's an interesting thing. We know, for example, like the, the chapters, verses, assignments, all that stuff, or an invention that came later on to help us navigate God's Word. So continuity would be to go forward in Matthew. But guess what? We're not going to. <laughs> we are, in a few weeks, going to pick it up in Matthew 17. And we're going to see contextually what Jesus is talking about. Because they're going to get a glimpse. There's going to be a preview for Peter, James, and John of coming attractions of the kingdom of God on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's what he's talking about. And we'll clarify that in a few weeks. And the reason it's going to be a few weeks, folks, is because it's been a while, but next Sunday and the following Sunday, I'm going to be doing a prophecy update. In light of all the events that are happening in the world, rapidly things are happening that are fulfilling Bible prophecy. It's so, so powerful, and I really feel compelled the next two Sundays to definitely do a prophecy update. And folks, remember, according to Revelation 19.10, that the essence, the heart of prophecy, is to give a clear witness for Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Remember, almost a third of the Bible is prophecy. Half of the prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled. Every detail. That means all the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled and some that are happening before our very eyes will be fulfilled exactly the way God said it. And folks, we want people who are living fearfully because of COVID, who are living fearfully because of the economy being down, don't know what the world holds tomorrow. Well, you know what? If you know Jesus, you can walk in His love and His peace and, his, and you can know that no matter what happens in this world, that you have salvation and eternal life. And that's by far the most important thing. As we conclude today, kind of to put this all in perspective, I want you to go with me to 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And we find these incredible realities. We'll pick it up in verse 10. Paul, talking to Timothy, says this, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, didascalia, that's teaching. You've carefully followed my teaching, my manner of life, the way I've lived, Paul says, Purpose, you've seen my purpose. For Paul, it was, what was his purpose? Living for Jesus. Not as he had apprehended, apprehended anything, like he said in Philippians 3, but he pressed on to follow Jesus. His faith, that demonstration of trust in God, his faith was real. His patience, his long-suffering, his love, right, agape, selfless, sacrificial existence, his perseverance. Why did he persevere? What did he have to persevere through? Well, it says now, persecutions. And afflictions, he persevered through all of that. And make no mistake, guys, it wasn't Paul's strength that gave him the ability to do that. It was the grace and the empowerment of God, just like it is for us. Make no mistake that if we choose to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and follow Jesus, and if those and when those moments might come, God will meet us and empower us to live for him and to do what we have to do in that moment to endure whatever it might be. If you love him and you follow him, God will meet you in that time and give you what you need. He did for Paul, and Paul is pointing this out to Timothy. So in persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lustra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me, right? He hadn't died yet because God still had a plan and a purpose for him. Again, folks, we're not going to draw our last breath and spend again or into eternity until God's plans and purposes uniquely for you and I have come to a conclusion. It's time to go home. We should learn, though, to number our days, right? That's wisdom and make the most of each day. Look what he says, though. Verse 12, make note of this. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ shall suffer or will suffer persecution. Did you get that? Yes, and all who desire, who have a heart to live godly, to live a godly life, to live the way God wants us to in Christ. By the way, that's the only way we can is in Christ Jesus. We'll suffer what? Push back. Again, we live in America. While you and I are here safely today studying the Word of God, probably since the time we started worshiping, who knows how many Christians have literally died for their faith or suffered torture for their faith in one of these countries like China or in Iran or in Turkey, or in North Korea. Folks, 
again, don't make the mistake of assuming somebody may be laughing at you because you're a Christian or demeaning you because you're a Christian. You're all one of them Bible thumpers. You're one of them born-againers, folks. If that's, if that's all it takes for the enemy to derail us, or if we, have that, we don't have any courage beyond that, God help us. And if that steps on toes, I hope there's conviction this morning. If it's something that easily would keep us from wanting to let people know we know Jesus. Yeah, don't be one of those people that runs around every time you're ever, well, praise the Lord, hallelujah, God bless you. I mean, you know, there's some people that really don't think about how the world looks at you. Live your life in such a way that people are drawn to Jesus in you, right? And you can share. But there are some people who are Christians that frankly drive people away from them because of their behavior. Because they're just kind of weird about it. I'm sorry. But make it real. Live your life that Jesus shines through it. And here's the reality. Should authentic persecution or pushback ever come, God will be with us. He was with Paul, as he's told in Tim telling Timothy, right? And then finally, I want you to join me in Romans. Chapter 8. <laughs> Folks, this is where Rodney was. And I'm going to have the worship team come up as we conclude. And again, Rodney and I hadn't cooperated this but that was a Holy Spirit thing, the things that he read and he shared, right? In Romans 8, these final passages, again, I want to look at verses 16 through 18. And after we know we've come into this relationship and we're adopted into the family of God and we can call Father Abba, that means we actually know Him. We have been born again by the Spirit of the living God. It says this in verse 16, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, once we've been born again, right, that we are children of God. We've become children of God, John 1, 12. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, what are we seeing in Matthew 16? Sometimes that's what happens on the cross. Things die. They're suffering with the cross. If indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also, what? Be glorified together. Folks, anything that we would suffer that's challenging the side of heaven for Jesus or the cause of Christ will be worth it when we get home. We want, in that moment, we will know. And if we are suffering something very challenging and it's something that's an attack against you because of the cause of Christ, and you're questioning in the moment, is this worth it? Ask God to encourage you and to give you strength because someday, in a short time, it will be revealed that it will be worth it. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings, the difficulties, right, challenges of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. That word doxa also means honor. With the glory and honor which shall be revealed in us. One, when we get home. Folks, this is God's living an active and powerful word. And these final passages will take us out today. And if you don't know these as Christians, you need to know them. And I, I know a lot of Christians do know these, and for, for good purpose and for good reason. Remember this, Paul says then, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? Right? The things he's talked about. If God is for us, as Rodney had stated, who can be against us? Doesn't mean you're not going to have difficulties or challenges. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall then he not him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect, his chosen? It is God who justifies, right? Makes us right in his sight. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus is praying for you, if you know him. Isn't that an amazing thing to know Jesus is praying for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? By the way, that word flips us. Tribulation means deep distress and challenge. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That's what we have to ask ourselves as we take up our cross. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Wasn't Jesus a lamb led to the slaughter? Again, we don't live in a third world country where others literally are suffering for the cause of Christ. But look, no matter what the difficulties or challenges are, and I know there's some things that are relative to these things, but here's the truth. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Hooper no keo. We are more than, we're super overcomers. What? Because of Jesus, through Him, who loved us, 
For I am persuaded, are you persuaded, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that means demonic entities, nor power, principalities of powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing, any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, that's an exhaustive list. What is God saying? If you know Jesus Christ, if you're truly born again, there is not a thing that can separate you from that spiritual connection because you've been born again. What an amazing promise. What an amazing truth. And no matter how bad challenges may get for us, if we are persecuted and pressured, folks, it's worth it to take up our cross and to deny ourselves and to follow Him, right? Are we living for the now? Are we living for this world? Are we living for eternity? Are we living for Jesus Christ? That's what it comes down to. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' mighty and awesome name, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth, God, of your word. And Lord, passages like this can be challenging, God, because it really very clearly states to us that Jesus, as you paid a price for us to save us, that if we're going to follow you, there will be a price to pay. We may not know what that looks like for each of us personally, but Lord, if we deny ourselves and make you and your kingdom our priority, God, then the enemy's not going to like it, the world's not going to like it. But God, it's always worth making you first in our life, Lord Jesus. God, what would it profit us to have everything this world has to offer and yet not be faithful to you as believers, God? If we live that way, as soon as we enter into eternity because we're saved by grace, Lord, our hearts would be heavy as we stand before the Bema seat, Lord, and our lives are reviewed and we see that we squandered the opportunities you provide. God, our hearts will be heavy, even if it's just for a moment. But Lord, if we have counted the cost and we've been willing to follow you, knowing that you will empower us and give us what we need by the infilling and the empowerment of your Holy Spirit and the enablement of your grace, God, we know that it'll be worth it, and someday we will stand before you, and that's when we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, help us to be wholly dependent upon you. God, help us to be Christ-centered in all that we do, Jesus, our eyes and our hearts and our lives completely fixed upon you. And as Lord, as we turn back to a time of worship, these last two songs, Lord, we, in preparation for it, God, quiet our mouths, Lord, and we close our eyes and we open our hearts to you. And Lord, in these next few minutes as we wait before your throne, God, just speak to our hearts. And thank you, Lord, again. You are the source of our life and our courage and all that we need. So Lord, again, before we sing these songs, just meet us here now in Jesus' name.